in order to finish quickly than you know reading to to understand so i've also learned to at least you know read the book twice so that there's a there's a big understanding and also there's a there's a broader perspective so thank you for for giving me this opportunity and i'm you know i'm looking forward to learning you know the the wisdom from each and every one and also sharing um the knowledge that um i do have thank you thank you um so we'll start our book panel discussion now uh, and i just wanted to say minister even though you're not officially part of the panel today you are welcome to jump in uh, if you feel like commenting or um, asking a question on any of the the issues that we're discussing um, and like i said um, to the rest of the participants if you would like to contribute to conversation, please write your comments in the chat and we'll be looking at that throughout. Um, so maybe we can start then with uh, Spiwe. I know people always say ladies first, but I don't know why they say that. So maybe you can share with us just what was your overall experience of the book? Um, how did you find the experience of reading the book? I think firstly, um... You know the the content is good. Um, the language is is um, very easy, simple English, so you you get to understand uh, you know what is being said much quicker. And the most fascinating thing is is the name of the characters. You know, uh, yes. some <laughs> um, and 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 also. I think after a while, then you realize that, you know, um, this is actually what transpired before, you know, um, the oppression, whether it's, it's, it's political or the injustices or, you know, children being children, uh, you know, doing the best and getting the best out of, um, you know, those difficult situations, mostly coming from you know, destitute, uh, impoverished areas, but they still manage to to have fun. You know, mm -hmm. naughty, they they still go us. It's something that I used to do with my friends as well. Being 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 naughty, you know, going somewhere with my friends and and try to to steal whether it's candy or something from the shop. And you go, you get home, you either you come home late uh, and you missed your bath time. You get a beating, you know, and there's friends of mine whom we grew up together. You find that they are eight in a two-room house. So most of the story, it's it's, it's really, really um, authentic. Mm. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I think, so, so what I'm hearing you say is that you could relate to um, some of the, the content that you were reading in the novel. Um, the Chaba, did you find that you could relate to any of the, the themes or the ideas in the novel? Yes, I definitely. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, you know, I I second what Piwe said it, with regards to how relatable the book was. And one of the things that I connected with in regards to the novel is the actual story, the amount of changes that the main character has had to go through in terms of the transitions from one circumstance to another. And I think we underestimate the difficulties that children go through because we just think kids are just kids. Uh, but when we actually look back at our own lives and acknowledge the fact that we overcome a lot and I think this is a story as much as it dips towards the end I think it's a story of adjusting to change and finding yourself through every single circumstance that you go through mm -hmm. yes it's true um it's also really interesting what I found interesting was um reading the story from the perspective of a child 
Um, and I was wondering whether either of you had any thoughts on that. How did you find that experience of reading um, or encountering the world, which um, some of the themes that she raises are very deep and actually profound and not really what children should be dealing with at that age, um, but she explores them through the eyes of a child. So how was that experience for you? I think what, what children go through um, you know, at, at their young age, um, as, as long as they are, they are okay, with their friends, the friendship is good. They get to meet up and play, you know, regardless of the challenges that they may face or the situation at home. Uh, it's okay for them, you know, uh, not realizing how deep and tough the situation is. They'll, they'll always find a way, you know, to, to make the best, you know, out of, out of um, the situation. And I mean, uh, it, it, it's a story whereby when you come from uh, uh, a poor background, the only thing that makes you happy is kicking the ball and outside. You don't, have, you don't even need a stadium you know, to, to go and play football. Uh, whether it's on the streets, you, you use your, um, the stone as, as, as goalpost. That's where most the passion is born, the passion is developed. In, in those uh, backgrounds, but as time goes on, then you know there's the, 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 there's now the new interest in, in in other important things. That's when you realize that how tough it was and how tough the, the upbringing was, and you also appreciate your 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 parents for um, you know the sacrifice that they made for you to to have a good upbringing or maybe a better bringing without focusing more on, 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 on um, the obstacles and hurdles, but focusing on being a happy child. Mm, thanks for those reflections. Um, and one of the things that you raised was the idea of, uh, of friends or of community um, that you have to support you. And I think in the novel, what it shows is that even though um, in paradise, the place in Zimbabwe where Darling used to live, um, although the circumstances were very difficult in many ways, um, Darling at least had her friends and she had her family and like a sense of connection and community. And that was very different in America um, when, when she moved there and she was kind of isolated. So, um, Masichan, share with us maybe some of your reflections on that that idea of of community and isolation and uh, belonging thank you Catherine and I really quite enjoyed uh, Sipiwe's uh, inputs on his reflections on the book I hope that everyone can hear me because there's a storm that's raging outside <laughs> Yes, I'm exactly. literally moving around my house trying to find connectivity. And if, if, if everyone doesn't mind, I've switched off my video so that I can at least try and get as much connection as I possibly can. But to answer your question, Catherine, my entire life has been based around my socialism in terms of this is the reason why this book really, really clicks for me because no one really truly understands the impact that moving can have on a child or an individual when you have to be uprooted. Next thing, you're living in another state, you're living in another country or living in another province. And what that requires of you in terms of adaptability. So it's been both a blessing and a curse, if we are to be truly honest. But then the curse has turned into a blessing in the sense that not needing to affiliate myself with groups or a structure has strengthened my ability to be an individual. And I think this is where I totally connect with the storyline. And furthermore, it took, it took my entire life it took me becoming an adult to really appreciate the value of the experiences that I've had. 
So, and, and by the way, one of the reasons why I love this book particularly is because my mother gave me a diary when I was uh, seven years old in the United States in Oakland, California. And that became my book. I, I saw myself in the first chapter of this book because that was me writing about my experiences and it was my coping mechanism. And this is something that we should encourage children to do. It's not just about writing books for the sake of selling books. It's about writing to cope. It's about writing for your mental wellness. It's about writing as a strategy to manage your life, you know, in terms of your expectations, in terms of your future, in terms of understanding your being, because you can only understand self by introspecting yourself. And the only way to introspect yourself is to, to document your experiences. You read them, you look back, you... When I look back at the things that I wrote when I was a kid, I literally can't even believe where my mind was at the time. And I, I get to understand why I am the person that I am today. That's the reason why I would inspire young people, kids to start writing. The best gift that you can give a child is a notepad or a diary and a pen. Thank you. Thanks so much, Master Chaba. Uh, I really agree. It, it is uh, very important for young children, even very young children to start exercising their own voices. Um, and I think you've also raised a, a lot of different themes that come up in the book, um, just in your reflections uh, on your own experiences. Um, one of the other ideas that's explored in the book of home um, and what that means to different people. Um, since, darling, since Darling starts out um, in paradise, or she actually starts out in another, what she calls a real home, then family has to move to paradise, uh, which she, she doesn't really think of as her real home. And she's always kind of longing for this place that she will belong. Um, and she finds when she goes to America, it's not necessarily that place either. Um, so I was wondering whether either of you have reflections on what you think home actually means, whether it's from the novel or from your own experiences. Um, what are some of the ideas around what home can mean and, and belonging? And especially in, uh, I guess, an increasingly global world where we travel a lot, where we do migrate to other spaces, what does, what does home mean? I think I, 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 I believe in the saying, um, there's no place like home. You know, you, you can go everywhere, but home will always be home. Um, that's where, that's where your dreams are made. That's where your memories, you know, will always be. And uh, it, it's always nice to, um, you know, aspire greatness and also, um, you know, visualizing yourself in a, in a foreign country because it looks beautiful on TV. That's a, that's a perfect world. You know, everyone wants to go live in the States or in Europe because it's beautiful, the weather is beautiful, but um, sad reality is that, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't um, look like how it's been portrayed, uh, whether on TV or in public, you know, um, it's difficult. I've traveled all over the world and when I get there, it makes me, in fact, to appreciate where I come from more, that there is no place like home. You know, we live and seek for greener pastures, but when you get to the other side, uh, the struggle is real. Thanks for those reflections. And you've raised, I think, another important theme in the book, which is the idea of um, like representation versus reality. Um, and we see that when, um, when Darling and her friends are playing their games. And I think I see in the chat, uh, Lebu Khan has spoken about country game, um, how they 
they have this idea that countries like America and like South Africa even and the UK are like this amazing dream place that they would like to go to. And um, when they arrive there, often they find that it's more difficult than they imagined. Um, and so you see the idea of representation versus reality. Um, and we also see that in um, ideas or just images that people have of what Africa is like, um, as like a place of extreme poverty and suffering. And you contrast that to Darling's experiences with her friends, which are quite full of life and fun, as you mentioned spirit, um, at the beginning. Um, so would either of you like to comment on, um, on that theme of representation versus reality in, in the novel and in your experience of, um, of traveling, of living in South Africa in terms of the way that it's represented maybe outside of the country? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's very difficult to, you know, to stay in a foreign country, especially as an African. You know, there are so many challenges that you go through. Um, the language, uh, people see you differently. The, the perception that people have about Africa, you know, and some people till this day, they think that as soon as they landed or tumble, you know, they'll bump into a lion. And there's, there's, there's no respect uh, for, 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 for Africans, um, which is really sad. But that's reality, you know. And we 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 need to teach people that um, you know Africa is capable of 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 achieving anything if only given a fair chance. I think we've we've demonstrated, you know, in in, in 2010 when we hosted um, one of the biggest sporting events in the world, you know. Um, first World Cup in, in, in Africa and, and it was a success. So uh, it's an opportunity again to, to teach people, you know, um, to learn and to relearn and unlearn as well. Thank you. Uh, I see Minister, your hand is up. Would you like to comment on something? No, I just wanted to participate in the conversation myself. <laughs> oh, thank you. That when I started reading the book, unfortunately, uh, um, there's lots of. Uh, I hope you can hear me. There's lots of rain around here, so. Yes, we can. Cool. So I'll say when I started reading the book, I went straight to the pages, and I was struck by the name to say "darling." It doesn't sound like South Africa, but the initial reading and searching for me. It felt like we have sent in and, and Alex. I, mean, I grew up in a township which people, which when I grew up was like Alex before it was uh, removed. So I could learn quite well some of the setting itself. But what also struck me when I was reading the book and went back on the on the on the author herself to say, oh, that's not South Africa, it's a certain Zimbabwe. There are two things that struck me. One, maybe as a politician to say, I hope God, things are not perfect in our country, but we don't reach a stage where our children's dreams are about being away, dreaming to be away from home. It really struck me to say, of all the difficulties, we shouldn't reach a stage where even in the midst of our difficulties, our children's dreams are about leaving home, they're dreaming of anything else, that they should dream to be the best they can be in South Africa. Even wherever they go, they should always really know that South Africa is their home. It reminded me of an incident two years back when I was in France, there was this, I mean, it's a professional and colleague who was so excited, was sharing champagne champagne with us in France to say he's so happy he got a French citizenship. And I just felt, oh my God, it's quite sad to really wish not to be you because you are South African, your home is South African and the experiences of telling and them just confirmed my, my, my feelings about really what it means to be outside home. It actually even made me appreciate the, the traffic that you get at the border to say when people push to go home when it's Christmas, 
It's exactly this feeling of wanting to go home, no matter what it means, sleeping in the border with all the difficulties, but just feeling that it's time to go home and you can take any suffering. And you yeah, are just being away in America where you don't even have the, the Bay Beach broad, a, a, a border to push, to go and see your family. It just is such a painful experience. So I mean, I could relate to it in different senses to say, I pray that Africa finds itself and can become a home to its children because it's so painful to have to be a runaway as if you don't have a country of your own which will embrace you and and enable you to travel the way you want to must be able to go and come back uh, or stay and not have to go. So it really struck me in that sense. And I don't want to take the time. I mean, the silent rapes that a child would have been raped and quietly somebody pressed her mouth and which means it ends there. Of all these untold rapes and getting women in lifetime traumas because they couldn't speak about their experiences, it's shameful. It also has all sorts of things that one can relate to. And I, I really think it is a very beautiful book. Thanks. Thank you so much, Minister, for those reflections. I think you've raised so many different important points um, in that contribution. Um, and definitely the one of the things that the book brings to the forefront most prominently is that idea of um, of feeling homesick actually and feeling also like you've maybe abandoned your country even though um, you want to all you want to do is just have a better life for yourself or for your children. Um, Master Chava, would you like to share any reflections on that idea and um, particularly maybe on the migrant experience, which is something that the book um, it speaks about Dalek's experience as a migrant, but also more broadly about um, immigrants in, in countries like America and also in South Africa. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you very much, Minister, for the sentence. So this particular element of the book really resonates very deeply with me because I've been a migrant my whole life and we are all migrants. If you really, really, really apply your mind, you will see that we are all migrants. None of us come from where we think we come from, um, except for those who truly originate from the places that we, we reside in. So I've been a migrant every single place that I've lived in, including South Africa. Um, I'm a South African citizen. My parents are South African citizens. I was born in Zambia, lived in Zimbabwe, lived in the United States of America. And one of the things that really has impacted me the most about being a migrant is identity and truly understanding who I am in light of my existence so it's not very easy to connect with your with your identity to be who you are when you don't even live where you come from when you were not raised where you were born it's 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 quite a uh, a dynamic and very complex existence and you have to constantly figure yourself out in spite of the cultures that you're exposed to, in spite of the, the, the lifestyle that you're exposed to, then constantly just staying rooted and understanding that I'm an African and I come from South Africa and this is who I am. These are my roots. And coming back and having to remember. So many people don't know that the word remember means to reconnect with yourself, to re-member. You are a member, you are coming back to yourself. So what that means, I'm, 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 I'm trying to get into this without getting too deep, but I, I, if I may, for two minutes. So spiritually speaking, when we are born, we are the purest forms of ourselves. 
in the sense that that's the reason why barbana babies are kibadim. That's why kids are more spiritually connected to their higher selves and can connect, can kids have a sense for things. Kids can feel, can, can are more connected to what's happening in their environment than adults. Because the, the older we grow, the deeper we get into society and into our lives, the more we lose ourselves, the more we become influenced by circumstances around us, the more we become influenced by our experiences, our environments, etc. But babies are more connected. So when we talk about remembering, we talk about coming back, connecting yourself to your true self. And, and for me, that's what really the book is about uh, in terms of the journey, just reminding me where I've been, reminding me where I come from and where I'm going. And we should never forget these elements because when we forget that, we forget who we truly are. And that for me is the most important lesson. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I think you, you raised some important points also about um, children and how they see the world. Um, and I think I really enjoyed reading the first part of the book when um, Darling is a younger child um, because she just sees the world in a very uh, almost a black and white way and she can see through um, some of the some of the people put up and some of the stories some of the stories that adults tell each other um, and they tell children and expect children to believe those stories. Um, but often children can see through that and they can see what's really going on. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the ideas that also relates to identity in the novel um, is the theme of names. So it is called We Need New Names. Um, and it speaks about um, how names often carry meaning in African cultures, especially. Um, and it also speaks about the immigrants that, that change their children's names or change their own names when they move to places like America so that they would fit in better. Um, maybe Spewit, did any of that resonate with your experience, um, the idea of naming and, and names carrying significance and then all the um, fitting in a certain place? Um, I think you're muted. Sorry, I missed that. Uh, I was just speaking about the idea of names um, in the book and how the names often carry a significance or a meaning in many African cultures and are like a link to a place of home or belonging. Um, and then also it speaks about how some people change their names to fit in better in America or in, uh, in other contexts. Yeah, I, I think as, as, as you know, Africans, um, our names are very important. You know, they, they're very meaningful. And, and with regards to, to the names on the book, they are very, very funny. And it was a, it was a, um, a given that, uh, you know, the, the place paradise is in, is in Zim because of, uh, of, of um, the names. But obviously, I, I think we somehow tend to be ashamed of, of um, you know, our names because of, uh, of I don't know, uh, trying to fit in. So obviously, you'd want to, to, to change um, your name just to be accommodated, you know, to wherever that you, you, you want to be. And we, we live in a society where we want to, to fit in. You know, um, mostly everything is in instant because we want to to keep up, and it, 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 it's sad because uh, you know that's where most of the dreams are being shattered. Because we tend to take um, the shortcut, we we tend to assume that um, you know uh, 
the grass is greener on the other side. And once you get to the other side, then it's, it's difficult and there's no turning back. Thank you for those reflections. Um, and then just another question, maybe uh, as South Africans reading the novel, how did you feel about the way that it portrays South Africa? So um, at times, or most of the time when it speaks about South Africa, uh, Darling is quite critical about the way that um, foreigners are treated. And how did you experience that? How did you find that? Do you think it's a fair characterization? Honestly speaking, I, I, I think there's a, there's a truth in it, you know, that um, people love South Africa. Africans love South Africa. They see South Africa as, as um, you know, a place of hope, a place where they'll get, um, you know, uh, opportunities, a place where, um, you know, they, their lives will improve, will improve, and a place where they will eradicate you know, um, poverty. And when you get to that place, at times you, you get overwhelmed um, by the situation. You know, uh, whether you came here looking for a work or by work, but you, once you lose focus, you know, you, 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 you become comfortable and then complacent and then mediocre after that. And then you are gone. You know, if you don't take care of yourself, you, you'll be lost in a place um, that you thought that you know you you were pursuing your dreams and your dreams were going to be a reality. And when you go back home, you know you'll only go back um, if you're fortunate enough. You 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 you'll go back like um, uh, Darling's father did. You know you get sick and you lose your family. So it's the same as going to Europe as well. If you don't take care of yourself, you know, there'll be, um, you know, tough consequences. Thanks. Uh, Master Chavo, would you like to add anything on that idea of um, experiences of South Africa? Yeah, I would thank you very much. Um, Pure. Thank you, Catherine, for the inputs. I would just like to, over and above what has been inputted by Spiwe, just to say that, you know, it's important that we stay connected, you know, and it's through such books and through literature and sharing of knowledge and, and stories and experiences that we are able to connect to one another because at the end of the day, and especially in light of our experience, our lived experience today with COVID-19, things are tricky at the moment. We are at a much greater disadvantage than we have ever been. Books were important then, literature was important then, but it's more important now uh, because of the fact that we have very few platforms where we can connect as human beings and combine a world that is currently divided and told to stay apart. So for me, I'm more appreciative of books because now more than ever, books can now take us to places where we've never been. Books can now create relationships that we've never had. So that for me is my contribution in conclusion. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, I think, yeah, you've raised a really important point about um, the ability of books to foster that connection, even now when we can't physically connect with, with many people. Uh, it really can be a way of traveling beyond the, the boundaries of your own home and your own uh, little local community. Um, so I just wanted to go uh, to ask Sim Tembile if he has any questions from the chat um, that he would like to ask the panelists or any comments. Uh, good day, everyone. Oh, good afternoon. Um, so from the chat, the theme that's coming about is the one of um, the standard of living and the ability of a 10-year-old 
to identify uh, different standards of living and how, we how she perceives different countries and grades them in the world. So in the game, in, in, in the chat, I'm just grouping and uh, summarizing what people are coming about in the comments. Uh, she views certain countries as superior than others, and that has an impact on how she sees her own country. And she keeps on referring to her own country as a toot country, uh, uh, the language she uses in the book. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to, to, to know from, from the panel as to has your perception about other countries and them having whether um, a higher standard of living uh, and all of that had an, inf an impact on how you view yourself as a South African or how you view yourself as an African? Yeah, I think, I think it's true what's been said in the book. Um, you know, countries are not the same. Uh, countries are not equal. And from from finance point of view, um, the other countries are, are much much way way better than than others. You know, as you said, that um, the country there's countries and there's 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 better uh, countries as well. And 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 um, you know, I'm I'm, I'm grateful that. Our country is one of one of the best in, in, in Africa. And and you know, we we are doing we are doing well and we, we up there against um, one of the best, you know, whether in Europe or in the in the US. Oh, okay. Uh Masi Chaba, you want to chime in? No, I will um, allow for someone else to input. Okay, Catherine, you can take over. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I think also one of the one of the comments that I saw was around games um, as a way of understanding some of these very complex, sometimes um, like global realities. So uh, like they, the children in the novel play country game and they play a game called Find Bin Laden. Um, they play or they sort of act out um, even traumatic events that they see happening. Mm -hmm. um, and it's almost a way for them to process um, the trauma that they see around them and the, the very big um, issues that they're dealing with. Um, would either of you like to comment on that and um, either from, from the book or from your own experience about children um, using games and play as a way of working through sometimes mm. traumatic experiences? Okay, um, thank you, Catherine. If I may through mm -hmm. the I will take the first bite just by saying that as a mother of two children, I have two sons. My firstborn son is 12 years old. My second born is seven years old. And it's through games that we really truly get to know our children and understand their personalities and also get to see truly deeply into their lived experiences. And this is the reason why therapy, child uh, therapy is structured in the way that it is so that children are able to play and mm. to be themselves so that we can truly find out who they are. You only know children when you play with them. So I can just reveal um, that it is a regular culture in my household that we play Uno we play games in this house and these games reveal the children's personalities. One of them is a firecracker. The other one is like the water personality. And what I mean by that is the one is um, got a short temper. The other is very calm and patient and introverted. Then you understand how these personality traits influence them educationally and how they perform at school, 
and how they relate to kids and adults outside of the home. So, you know, these are some of the things that really we, we get to extract from the book um, because we have to play games with children to understand who they are. It's not a matter of going and watching movies or sitting at home and watching television, no. It's only through games that you can actually get to understand a true character. So that's how I relate to it. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I, I share the same sentiments with uh, Mas Chaba that, you know, uh, it's only through games that we, we get to learn what, uh, you know, children want to do. And, and also as, as children, no one wants to um, play a role where they are struggling or choose a career that is not good. Everyone wants the best, you know. That's why in the book they were fighting. Uh, all of them wanted to be a doctor. No one wanted to be a patient because if you're a doctor, then you, you are playing a bigger role and it's a, it's a, it's a big career as well. So it's a, it's a message um, to us to pay attention to, to children and, and, and also um, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to see that what children do want, you know, what, what is the path they want to do it without them saying it, but through these games. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, we can often access a different side of children um, through play and through games than we would if we just had a conversation with them. Um, and it is a way of processing the, the larger realities in their society. Um, so maybe as we wrap up, um, as a final question to each of the panelists and also to the minister, if she would like to answer this question as well, um, was, was there anything that the book taught you or did you learn anything new from the book? Did it uh, broaden your perspective way? Um, and what is your take out um, coming out of the book? Um, anyone can go first. I think in, in, go first. Oh, ladies first now. <laughs> Gentlemen first this time. <laughs> I think for me, definitely, definitely it has, it has uh, brought in my perspective because I, I love reading, you know, I want to uh, learn as, as much as I can. And this is what was an opportunity for me to, to learn as well. Like I said before, that uh, the story is very, you know, relate, relatable. And some of um, the things I've experienced before, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a philanthropist. I, I am a role model to many. And I also have my own book, you know, where um, uh, it's about my story, a young boy from uh, Soweto in the dusty streets who loved football with all his heart and wanted to play football at the highest level. And he got that opportunity, but it didn't come easy. There were a lot of obstacles and sacrifices that he had to make and he had to endure. And eventually when he got that opportunity, he scores the biggest goal in the world and that's how he becomes a superhero. So it's a story that will inspire the, you know, the African child that their dreams are valid, that they shouldn't be defined by you know, their background and uh, to dream and not to give up. And also you know, to, to have a role model that is authentic, a role model that doesn't fly, a role model that you can easily bump into a shopping mall or anywhere for that matter. You know, so it's a, it's a, it's a story that, um, the kids will enjoy it. There's graphics in it, you know, and obviously as kids, the um, concentration spends a bit, you know, little as compared to others. So it's not a big book, but it's a book that uh, will, will keep the dream alive for the kids, that anything is possible. If he did it here, you know, coming from Soweto, I can do it coming from Tanzania or Hampahela or anywhere for that matter. So, it it was a great book i really enjoyed it and yeah thank you so much for the opportunity 
Thank you for being here. You definitely are a role model. Um, and thank you for the role that you're playing also in encouraging children and adults to read. Uh, Master Chaba, do you have any closing reflections on the book or this experience? Definitely, thank you so much. Um, I've taken my chances with putting the video back on. Uh, the rain has subsided. So um, I'm honored and truly blessed to have been selected, chosen to be part of this movement, the third virtual reading club on this day, the 24th of February, 2021. It's a big deal. It's a big deal because the only way that we can truly, truly know who we are as a nation and really understand where we come from, where we are going, is to, to document our lives, whether fictional, non-fictional, it really doesn't matter what, what you write, just write. And I would furthermore encourage anyone and everyone who's listening to create for the sake of creating. We have to remember where we come from. We come from a, a legacy of people who used to cut their own hair, who used to build their own fences and their own houses, make their own food. So now we've become a people who are leaning on support structures and relief funding and all sorts of strategies and, and support methods to survive when actually we were the originators, the creators. So don't be afraid. Just write for the sake of writing. Don't write to create a blockbuster book or film or just write, you know, just take a pen and a paper and just release whatever is inside of you because you are born of ancestors who were creators. They were we are producers by nature. So I think that's my fundamental uh, message today for anybody and everyone who is listening to say that whether you are a writer, whether you are a television producer, whether you are a caterer, whether you cook food, whether you are a farmer, whether you are an engineer, whether you work with your hands, I don't care what you do, but make sure that you continue to produce for the sake of producing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chava, for that encouragement. Um, Minister Motseha, would you like to share any closing thoughts? Um, and if not, then maybe I can hand over to Palesa Kambi. So she'll be talking about the next session that we're hosting in March. Thank you so much, Catherine, and uh, thank you so much to all of the attendees, um, our panelists, Mas Chaba and Spiwe, and uh, the minister as well. Um, thank you so much um, to all of the people that also just made time to be with us today um, to you know, put forward this uh, very important initiative. The next uh, virtual reading club will be on the 25th of March. And we would like to invite all of you that attended today and uh, your friends, colleagues and uh, other partners as well to please attend the next one. And to also make suggestions for the next book that you would like to see uh, the virtual reading club review. Um, all of the suggestions can either be placed here on this chat whilst we are still on, or you can email them to info at nrc.org.za. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, so I'll hand it back to Godwin to close the session officially. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Oh, so Thank I, I think now uh, we are into Jerusalem. I don't know who it is, um, but I, I I can say that you know I've also been lost 
I've already been in Budapest, uh, as the book, you know, suggests. So there's nothing much to say other than to thank you, uh, Catherine. I think you have facilitated the session very well. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, today we had hit about 400, I mean, 240 people, both on YouTube and Zoom. And uh, so the number is going up. And in fact, I want to challenge the team to get to a thousand. I just want to believe that uh, uh, all of us would have family around us so that in the end we have much more than the 240 that were registered here. Um, I don't know if Minister has fallen off and, and so on, but I saw, you know, I was spying on her and she used her husband's uh, you know, machine to connect. I hope you were sitting there you know, listening to, to the stories. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Minister. I mean, that's the whole idea. We need to bring our families uh, I can tell you that uh, one of the colleagues on the chat, I mean, on the on the reading session, Dr. Dube, texted me and said, oh, Simpiwa is doing wonders to my boys. Today, they had to come and sit around. I also have my three boys sitting around today. So I think it's great stuff uh, because we know that boys actually lag behind, you know, girls in as far as reading is concerned. So fantastic. We really are very thankful to Masichaba and Simpiwe for all the thoughtful reflections and for, I'm sure for bringing, <clears throat> for bringing you know, other you know, followers. So what you did not know Masichaba and, uh, and Simpiwe is that once you actually review a book, the first we had the minister, uh, Professor Marwala from uh, UJ, the vice chancellor and myself, you know, reviewing. And then we had two uh, you know, other reviewers, but the story is once you actually review the book, you become what we call reading Induna. So in this whole movement, so you're becoming Indunas. And if you're an Induna, you've got to organize people around you to continue you know, with the reading. And in that manner, you uh, make the cycle bigger. But since we're talking about uh, need for new names, I can't help but talk about this story, you know, Maschawa. Uh, I got stuck in Lusaka and I needed to fix my trailer and the mechanic told me the only place you could get the part uh, that was broken was in Lusaka. So, you know, as dark as I am, I started to turn red, but actually after a few seconds, he told me that there is a, in Soweto in Lusaka, I mean, there's a Soweto in Lusaka and he took, took me to a Soweto in Lusaka which pretty much looks like Alex, if you've been to Alex and those scrapyards and so on. So this business of needing new names is actually a reality um, beyond Bastard and, and Stina. Uh, but what kind of concerned me was the Pastamboro. And I was like, when was this book written? And Pastamboro, as you know, you know, Pastamboro is very much South African, but very interesting indeed. Um, I just would like to re-emphasize what Palesa has uh, you know, spoken about. For uh, all of you to please visit the NRC website or email the NRC info email, which is info at NRC, standing for National Reading Coalition, dot org dot ZA. Suggest you know, the next book. And that we can read. You can also suggest, you know, the reviewers, because the truth is that the NECT essentially is playing the role of a secretariat. This is a South African movement that the, the president has called upon. And all we're doing is to coordinate South Africans. So we we'll very much want to even decide on the books on the basis of, you know, from the network. So if you could suggest a book and the next people that you may want us to, to invite to come and review, I think we also need to explore the possibilities of uh, getting the authors themselves to come and tell us what they thought, what they wrote the book. And in the, in the advent of uh, virtual uh, meetings, I mean, we can get an author from anywhere, Zimbabwe or Budapest or, um, <clears throat> or in, in the US for that matter. So lastly, uh, and I always do it, and maybe minister can have the last week, and I always agitate. I want to say minister that we are very patient people we are waiting for uh, Mr. President to come and meet with his uh, uh, reading club when there's no budget speech and we'll make sure that we avoid the budget speech day. 
so that the next time or the, 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 the session after, the president may in his uh, uh, physically, I mean, virtually come and meet his reading club. So Catherine, I don't know if minister is there and she wants to say goodbyes. No, I'm still here though. This thing keeps on throwing me out. Funny, Gordon, even his office was quite concerned that we have this reading club today. As I said, I was in parliament. I had to leave them when they were not finishing to say, I can't miss this one out. And his office, you know, sometimes people in the presidency think <laughs> that the world revolves around a president to say, is, is it not possible for us to postpone? He wants to be there. I said, no, it's not possible. Next time. So we will tell him when, when the next time is. But I know he wants to, to really come. And you remember December, he sent us his whole reading list. Yes. And he told me that he's done, out of the 10 he gave us, he's already done eight. And I said to him, President, this thing is so dynamic. We've even moved away from your reading list. So you are going to get the, the, the book to be reviewed from us. We'll still read the books. But in essence, he's still very keenly interested in the program. Just that, as I say, today also clashed that he had to be in parliament and support the Minister of Finance, but he's keen. And I told him, I said, President, that's where you really disengage with any other thing which is negative. That's the place to be where you engage meaningfully. There's content, there's constructive engagement. It is a real beautiful platform and we really want to encourage more people to come and disengage with anything else, but to really be part of, I think a very beautiful conversation that these platforms normally provide us. So I, I agree with you that even our panelists, um, I'm, I'm very excited, uh, Makumar Nomashamalala, thank you very much for, for, for joining us. And yeah, I don't want to say much and say even ourselves at this age, these books help you even understand and reflect on what is it that we did right or wrong when we're raising you so that we can advise you on what things to avoid in raising children, especially the playing part, you know, uh, in my earlier years with older children, it was raised quite a number of different generations. Because I was younger, I was more, much more patient, I could play with them. But when I started taking other children on, I never had time, so I was much more serious at that stage. I didn't play and I can tell you that's one of the fatal mistakes I did in my life with really not playing Scrabble, not playing anything with those kids. The relationships are very different. The older ones were closer, the younger ones, the very formal relationship was, it was when I was also very serious and formal. So, and reading the book, you can reflect yourself on, just so you learn all the time and all the way. So it's not, you don't stop. And that's what I really love about this book reviews and just a pleasure to read. Uh, you can imagine, so when I have to come to these uh, sessions and I had not finished the book, it means, I must cross night because it's, it's good. I have to go to the book review. So I can go on and on, but I, I really love these programs and will encourage, tell the president that he's, he's missed again. Well, thank you very much, Minister. His movement is moving, the revolution is moving. And I would like to end up with a, a tag today. So you may also want to tell him that uh, we at the NRC, the NRC, where you member yourself and thank you so much mm -hmm. for bringing mm -hmm. up that key member you know concept and, and, he was, uh, and he was the founder member of the NEC. i remember that i forgot that also what minister come again that is a founding member also of the NCT. i forgot that also he was a he, patron is it not so he, he is still the patron so okay. maybe, maybe it's time for him to remember himself okay yeah <laughs> Thank you very much, colleagues. We'll leave it here till we meet the next time. And Catherine, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, Chair. Bye. Thank you, Thank you, you. Thank thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Uh, thanks a million. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Bye. 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 Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. It was Bye. good Bye. to be here. Bye. <laughs>
Bye bye. 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 Thank <laughs> you.